Chapter 16 A torrential downpour on May 15th meant a day of rest for all pilots, but the respite was short, for before daybreak on the 16th, several B-25s swarmed over the field at treetop level, digging craters in the runway and shooting up maintenance facilities. For the second day in a row, we remained on the ground. It would take the entire day merely to fill in the holes and patch up the field. We sat around in the billets, several pilots catching up on sleep, while the rest of us discussed the rising tempo of the enemy attacks. A bomber pilot joined our group. He had landed at Lai for refueling and was grounded after the attack, and listened with interest to our descriptions of attacking the enemy bombers. After a while, he looked wistfully at the Zero fighters parked off the runway. You know, he said suddenly, I think my greatest ambition has been to fly a fighter, not these trucks we go around in. It's funny, he mused. We've been taking more and more punishment on our raids. Most of the men feel they'll never live to go home. I feel the same way. Yet, he turned to look at us, I would be satisfied if there was one thing I could do. We waited for him to continue. I'd like to loop that truck I fly, he added. He grinned. Can you picture that thing going around in a loop? One of the Zero pilots spoke up. If I were you, I wouldn't try it, he said softly. You'd never come out of a loop in one piece, even if you could get up and around into one. I suppose so, he replied. We watched him walk across the field and climb into the cockpit of a fighter, where he sat and studied the controls. At the time, we didn't know that all of us would remember this pilot for the rest of our lives. The day passed slowly, and that night Nishizawa, Ota and I went to the radio room to listen to the music hour, which came over nightly on the Australian radio. Nishizawa suddenly spoke up. That music, listen, isn't that the dance macabre, the dance of death? We nodded. Nishizawa was excited. That gives me an idea. You know the mission tomorrow, strafing at Moresby? Why don't we throw in a little dance of death of our own? What the devil are you talking about? Ota snapped. You sound like you've gone crazy. No, I mean it, Nishizawa protested. After we start home, let's slip back to Moresby, the three of us, and do a few demonstration loops right over the field. It should drive them crazy on the ground. It might be fun, Ota said cautiously. But what about the commander? He'd never let us go through with it. So, was the retort. Who says he must know about it? Nishizawa grinned broadly. We went off to the billet, and the three of us talked in whispers of our plans for the morrow. We had no fear about appearing over Moresby with only three fighters. Among the three of us, we'd shot down a total of 65 enemy planes. My tally was 27, Nishizawa had 20, and Ota had accounted for 18. We hit Moresby the next day with a maximum fighter sweep of 18 zeros, with Lieutenant Commander Tadashi Nakajima personally heading the formation. Nishizawa and I flew as his wingmen on the mission. The strafing was a failure. Every bomber on the field was hidden from our view. The story in the air was different. Three enemy fighter formations came at us over the field. We turned into the first group and took them in a head-on attack. In the swirling air battle, six P-39s, two of them mine, fell in flames. Several Zeros broke from the battle to shoot up the field, which proved later to be their undoing. Two fighters, badly shot up, crashed on the Owen Stanley slopes during the return trip. After the dogfight, we reformed. As soon as we were in formation, I signalled to Commander Nakajima that I was going down in pursuit of an enemy plane. He waved his hand, and I dropped down in a long turning dive. I was back at Moresby in a few minutes, circling above the field at 12,000 feet. The anti-aircraft remained quiet, and no enemy fighters appeared. Then two Zeros came in at my height, and we fell into formation. Nishizawa and Ota grinned at me, and I waved back in greeting. We gathered in a formation, with only a few scant feet between our wingtips. I slid my canopy back, described a ring over my head with my finger, then showed them three fingers. Both pilots raised their hands in acknowledgement. We were to fly three loops, all tied together. One last look for enemy fighters, 
and I nose down to gain speed, Nishizawa and Ota hugging my own plane. I pulled back on the stick, and the Zero responded beautifully in a high arcing climb, rolling over on her back. The other two fighters were right with me, all the way up and around in a perfect inside loop. Twice more we went up and around, dove, and went back into the loop. Not a single gun fired from the ground, and the air remained clear of any enemy planes. When I came out of the third loop, Nishizawa pulled up to my plane, grinning happily, and signalled that he wanted to do it again. I turned to my left. There was Ota, laughing, nodding his head in agreement. I couldn't resist the temptation. We dove to only 6,000 feet above the enemy field and repeated the three loops, swinging around in perfect formation. And still not a gun fired at us. We might have been over our own field for all the excitement we seemed to create. But I thought of all the men on the ground watching us, and I laughed loudly. We returned to lay twenty minutes after the other fighters landed. We told no one of what we had done. As soon as we could get together by ourselves, we broke into loud laughter and whoops. Ota howled with glee, and even the stoic Nishizawa slapped our backs with enjoyment. Our secret, however, was not to remain ours very long. Just after nine o'clock that night, an orderly approached us in the billet and stated that Lieutenant Sasai wished to see us immediately. We looked at each other, not a little worried. We could receive serious punishment for what we had done. No sooner did we walk into Sasai's office than the lieutenant was on his feet, shouting at us. Look here, you silly bastards, he roared. Just look at this. His face was red, and he could hardly control himself as he waved a letter, in English, before our faces. Do you know where I got this thing? he yelled. No, I'll tell you, you fools. It was dropped on this base a few minutes ago by an enemy intruder. The letter read, To the lay commander. We were much impressed with those three pilots who visited us today, and we all liked the loops they flew over our field. It was quite an exhibition. We would appreciate it if these same pilots returned here once again, each wearing a green muffler around his neck. We're sorry we couldn't give them better attention on their last trip, but we will see to it that the next time they will receive an all-out welcome from us. It was all we could do to keep from bursting out with laughter. The letter was signed by a group of fighter pilots at Moresby. Lieutenant Sasai kept us at ramrod attention and lectured us severely on our idiotic behaviour. We were ordered specifically never to stage any more flying exhibitions over enemy fields. It was a good joke, and we enjoyed every minute of our dance macabre over Moresby. None of us knew that night, however, that the next day was to be a true dance of death, executed without aerial histrionics. Seven zeros from our wing escorted eight bombers for an attack on Moresby. Hardly had we reached the enemy base when at least 18 fighter planes plummeted upon us from every direction. This was the first defensive battle I had ever fought. We were hard-pressed even to defend the eight bombers from the swooping attacks of the enemy planes. Although I drove several fighters away from the bombers, I failed to shoot down any planes. Three Allied fighters fell to the other pilots. The bombers, meanwhile, released their missiles, none too accurately, and then shakily swung into their turn to head for home. We saw a P-39 plunge with tremendous speed into the bomber formation, but could not move in time to disrupt the attack. One moment the sky was clear. The next, the Aero Cobra was spitting shells into the last bomber in the flight. Then it rolled and dove beyond our range. The bomber streamed flame. The airplane seemed familiar as I closed in to watch. It was the same Mitsubishi which had landed at Lei. Its pilot was the one with whom we had talked in the billet. The flames increased in fury as the bomber nosed down and skidded wildly. It lost altitude quickly and seemed on the verge of going out of control. At 6,000 feet, it was only a matter of seconds. The flames were engulfing the wings and fuselage. Suddenly, still blazing fiercely, the nose lifted and the bomber went into a climb. I gaped at the plane in astonishment as its pilot started to draw a loop, an impossible maneuver for the Betty. The pilot, the same one who had told us he wished to loop in a fighter, hauled her back and up. The bomber went up, hung on its nose in a half loop, 
and then burst into a seething ball of flame which blotted it out entirely. The flaming mass fell. Just before it struck the ground, a violent explosion shook the air as the fuel tanks went off. Chapter 17 The three months of May, June and July were filled with almost constant air battles. It was not until after the war that I discovered that our Lei Wing was the most successful of all Japanese fighter plane operations against the enemy, and that our continued successes were by no means repeated with such regularity elsewhere. Lei was nothing less than a hornet's nest of fighter planes to the enemy. Despite its position as a major base for our bombers and for surface shipping, not even Rabaul figured so highly in the destruction of enemy aircraft as we did during the four months from mid-April to mid-August. We flew what was then the outstanding fighter airplane of the entire Pacific theater. Our pilots enjoyed a clear-cut superiority against the enemy, many of them having gained their greater experience through combat in China and through the rigid and exacting training requirements of pre-war Japan. It was not surprising, therefore, that the enemy suffered such grievous plane losses against the Zeros, which flew from Lei. To us, however, it seemed that the courage of the pilots and crews who manned the B-25 Mitchells and B-26 Marauders was deserving of the highest praise. These twin-engined raiders lacked the firepower and the armor protection of the rugged flying fortresses. Yet, time after time, they flew against Lei and other targets minus the fighter escort our own high command deemed indispensable for the survival of bombers. They always came in low, anywhere from 1,500 feet above the ground to such a low level that they were actually slicing through the top of tree branches, as we saw more than once. They combined with their courage the highest piloting skill, and it was unfortunate for their ability that their airplanes proved no match for the maneuverable Zero fighter. Nevertheless, on more than a few occasions, their formations endured the very worst our fighters had to offer as they fled after their attacks. They were undaunted. They continued to come, continued to hit us with everything they had. Day and night their bombs slammed into the lay base and their gunners strafed anything which moved. Their morale was marvellous, despite the terrible toll we exacted of their ranks in the late spring and summer of 1942. On May 23rd, 7, Zeros caught five B-25s over Ley and sent one into the sea, 30 miles south of Salamaua. The following day, six bombers returned to Ley. Unfortunately for their crews, our island warning net sighted them far from Ley, and 11 fighters stormed the hapless bombers, burning and shooting down five, and badly crippling the sixth. I flew in both interception missions, and the records of Imperial headquarters credit me with three bombers shot down on those two days. The tempo of attacks increased as May drew to a close. For the first time, on May 25, four B-17s attacked with an escort of 20 fighters. Over the towering Owen Stanley Mountains, all hell broke loose when 16 Zeros plummeted into their ranks. Five enemy fighters went down, but the fortresses escaped. Three days later, Five unescorted B-26 returned to Ley. I chalked up another victory. On June 9th, I sent two more B-26s crashing into the ocean. The days seemed to blur into one another. Life became an endless repetition of fighter sweeps, of escorting our bombers over Moresby, of racing for fighters on the ground to scramble up against the incoming enemy raiders. The Allies seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of aircraft. A week never went by without the enemy suffering losses, and yet his planes came, by twos and threes and by the dozens. Through the passing years, many of the details of these battles have faded, despite the help of a religiously kept diary. But several episodes stand out clearly. Unforgettable was the slaughter of May 24th, when an alarm of incoming planes threw lay into an uproar. Six standby planes were already off the ground when the rest of us, clutching the sideboards of the swaying truck which brought us from our billet to the runway, reached the field. We were airborne without a moment to spare. My own fighter cleared the ground even as a stick of bombs tore the runway apart directly behind me. At least eleven zeros were airborne by the time six B-25s completed their runs and turned to flee for Moresby. 
Nishizawa and Ota were the first to reach the enemy planes, and they each hit one bomber, raking the Mitchells with cannon fire. In a few seconds, both B-25s were enveloped in flames. They crashed just beyond our airstrip. The rest of us jumped the four remaining bombers, which, by excellent evasive flying, dodged our firing passes and reached the open sea. All eleven fighters winged in hot pursuit of the enemy. Off Salamaua, we pressed home the attack. Again, it was a case of poor formation flying on the part of our pilots. Every man seemed to think the battle was his own, and raced in against the bombers without regard for his fellow pilots. Zeros banked sharply to evade ramming other fighters, and more than one pilot rolled desperately to evade the fire of another Zero shooting blindly at the bombers. Once they were over the water, the B-25s dropped to the deck, skimming not more than ten yards over the waves. Their tactics were sound. We could not dive too steeply and we were denied climbing passes. One Zero, screaming down in a dive at the lead bomber, misjudged his distance and plunged at full speed into the ocean. I caught the last bomber in a firing pass from above its tail. The B-25 held a straight course, and it was not difficult to concentrate my fire into the fuselage. In moments the air was filled with fire and smoke as the bomber reeled to the left and exploded as it hit the ocean. At sea level height, the B-25s were almost as fast as the Zero fighter, and we were hard pressed to keep up with the bombers and also go into our firing passes. Three enemy planes were still in the air when the six standby fighters turned for home out of ammunition. Lieutenant Sasai chalked up the fourth bomber, and we kept hammering at the two surviving planes. I got the fifth when, with its gunners apparently out of ammunition, the B-25 made a run for home after breaking away from the other remaining plane. The Mitchell took 1,000 rounds of machine gun bullets in its fuselage tank and exploded flame from the right wing. It skidded wildly and hit the water, where it exploded. It was a good day. Five out of six planes definitely destroyed. Several days later, I was involved in a new aspect of air combat, and one which proved, even after all our battles, sickening. I caught a lone B-26 overlay and pursued the enemy plane over the sea, shooting up the fuselage and right wing. The marauder burst into flames over the water, but before it crashed, four men bailed out. Each landed safely on the sea and the next moment, a small, bright life raft popped up. As I circled the raft, I saw that the men clung to its sides. Since they were only two miles from the Lay Air Base, it was only a matter of time before a boat would pick them up and make them prisoner. Suddenly, one of the men thrust his hands high above his head and disappeared. The others were beating fiercely at the water and trying to get into the raft. Sharks. It seemed that there were thirty or forty of them. The fins cut the water in erratic movements all about the raft. Then the second man disappeared. I circled lower and lower, and nearly gagged as I saw the flash of teeth, which closed on the arm of the third man. The lone survivor, a big, bald-headed man, was clinging to the raft with one hand and swinging wildly with a knife in the other. Then he, too, was gone. When the men on the speedboat returned to lay, they reported that they had found the raft empty, and blood-stained. Not even a shred of the men was visible. Chapter 18 On May 20th, we fought the highest air battle in our history, when Commander Nakajima led 15 zeros into the enemy zone at Moresby at a height of 30,000 feet. It took us an hour and 20 minutes, fighting for altitude all the way, to reach Moresby from Ley. We relied on our height to give us the advantage of surprise, and were astonished to encounter an enemy formation several miles ahead of us at the same altitude. I was doubtful of the Zero's ability to perform aerobatics at this height. My personal record height with the Zero was 37,720 feet, achieved with an oxygen mask and an electrically heated jacket. At that height, the plane was extremely sluggish at the controls and refused to climb another foot. Consequently, it seemed unwise to fight with the Zero at a height of 30,000 feet. There were 10 enemy fighters, apparently P-39s of a new design. I led the attack and was engaged at once. The 14 other Zeros met the head-on attack of the remaining planes. The controls were sluggish in the thin air. As the other plane came at me, 
I tried for an advantageous position from which to fire. We seemed almost to be moving in slow motion. I kept edging closer to the other fighter in a tight spiral and manoeuvred in for a quick burst. I yanked the stick over hard, too hard. Something seemed to crash into my chest and the oxygen mask slipped down to my chin. Afraid to release the controls because I might spin out of control, I fumbled helplessly in the cockpit, and then everything faded into darkness. I had blacked out. It seems that when a man is concentrating with all his power on a certain action, even a loss of oxygen fails to prevent him from carrying out, to some extent, what he had originally planned to do. I felt, even when I seemed to fall into unconsciousness, that my hands had frozen on the controls and kept the plane descending in its spiral maneuver. For when my head cleared and vision returned, I was at 20,000 feet, the plane still under control. I snapped out of the turn instantly, for it was likely that the Aracobra had followed me down and was setting me up for the kill. But the other plane was also in trouble. Possibly the pilot had turned too sharply at that height and had spun out, or perhaps he too suffered from lack of oxygen. Whatever the cause, there he was at 20,000 feet with me, spiralling around slowly. I shoved the throttle forward and headed for him, even as he came out of his seeming stupor. The next instant his wing was up and around and the P-39 came at me with all guns blazing, but the Zero was back in its element. I came out of a turn with the Aracobra above and to my right. One quick burst with my cannon and the plane broke in two. Only one other pilot registered a victory that day. Otter managed to bring down another P-39. The following day I got my first enemy fighter without firing a shot, in a battle which was exactly the opposite of the maximum height encounter. This time, on May 26th, we fought a wild-running duel at treetop level. We were in a group of 16 zeros when we encountered a strange enemy formation. Four B-17s flying in a column, with about 20 fighters flying in echelons of two and three planes grouped around the fortresses. We were below the enemy planes and were able to catch them almost unawares in a steep climbing attack. I flamed one P-39 and then the sky erupted into a swirling mixture of fighter planes, clawing at each other in individual dogfights. Most of the enemy fighters broke for the deck, pulling away from our own planes. A few, however, were forced to pull out of their dives by higher peaks and went into evasive maneuvers, as we hoped they would. I dropped to the tail of one P-39 directly over the jungle. The pilot was fearless. He seemed to brush trees and rock outcroppings as he turned and dove, banked and climbed with me on his tail. Every time he climbed, turned, or rolled, I cut down the distance between our planes. I snapped out a burst, which the Aracobra evaded by rolling violently to the left. The next moment the pilot dove again, directly into a tortuous valley, flanked closely by towering crags. Before I knew it, I was within the dangerous mountain pass, hot on the tail of the P-39. There was no time to concentrate on firing. I had all I could do to stick to the enemy fighter, which banked and wheeled in its hair-raising escape between the peaks. In no time at all, I had forgotten my original purpose. I was drenched in my own sweat. The motor seemed to thunder louder and louder in my ears, and the peaks and rocks swept perilously close to the zero as I rushed by at several hundred miles an hour. Then the mountain caught up with the enemy plane. The P-39 came out of a tight turn, and without warning faced a tremendous overhanging rock cliff which blocked our path. Instantly, the pilot jerked the Aracobra upward and rolled to get his wings out of the way. It was not enough. The wing hit, and the fighter snapped around, then exploded with a terrifying roar in the canyon. I saw the pieces hurtling by me only vaguely. No sooner did I see that rock than I hauled the stick back with every ounce of strength in my arms and kept it back. The Zero whipped upward in a violent loop, and for an eternity of a split second it seemed that I would meet the wall just as the Aracobra had. But the Zero responded perfectly, and I cleared the cliff by what appeared to be a matter of inches. It took me a few minutes to calm down and to wipe away the perspiration that drenched my face. I eased off on the throttle and climbed slowly, trying to relax, to shake off the tension. That was my 37th conquest, and, although I had not personally destroyed the plane, this was one of the most harrowing air battles I'd known. I found out later that day 
that Nishizawa and Ota had both done almost exactly the same thing, chasing two P-39s down a mountainside and whipping away in almost impossible rolling turns as the fighters in front of them smashed and exploded. That night, the billet roared in jubilation over the day's events. Chapter 19 During the last week of May, the Lei Wing carried out maximum effort fighter sweeps of the Moresby area, and in three days of wild air fighting scored tremendous successes against the Allied planes. Accordingly, Moresby was judged ripe for a knockout blow. On June 1st, 18 bombers from Rabaul, escorted by 13 fighters from Ley and 11 others from Rabaul, tried for the finishing stroke against the vital enemy bastion. We did not consider it possible for the Allies to mount any strong fighter opposition after the preceding battles, but we were wrong in this estimate. Twenty fighters roared into the big Japanese formation. Once more, it was a one-sided fighter versus fighter battle. Seven enemy fighters fell in flames, one from my guns, but they accomplished their purpose, scattering our bombers and destroying the accuracy of their aim. On the return to Ley, one of our bombers dropped out of formation, weaving erratically in the air. I dropped down with five other fighters to fly cover. The bomber was a flying shambles. Bullet holes and gaping openings from cannon shells riddled the wings and the fuselage and gave it the appearance of a sieve. I pulled up close to the nose and stared into the cockpit. Even at that distance, I could see the blood on the instrument panel and on the seats. It was a miracle that the plane flew at all. The pilot and co-pilot lay sprawled on the deck in pools of blood. The flight engineer struggled with the unfamiliar controls. I could not see the other four crewmen. Two turrets were smashed, and the men who had manned them were either dead or wounded. Only the flight engineer, fighting to keep the plane aloft, appeared unhurt. The crippled airplane circled slowly over the airstrip, going around and around, as the engineer studied the narrow runway below him. There was no way to help the unhappy man in the cockpit. We closed in and tried to guide him down, but whenever he took his eyes off the controls, the plane lurched dangerously. Gradually, he lost speed as he descended. There was no use in remaining aloft until his fuel ran out. The bomber circled over the water, skidded badly as it turned, and then approached the runway. I held my breath. He couldn't make it. With speed down, the plane rocked badly in the air and began to slide into a stall. It would crash at any moment. Then a miracle occurred. The pilot staggered to his feet. His face was white and caked with blood. He leaned heavily on the shoulders of the engineer. For those brief, vital seconds of the approach, he shoved the wheel forward and regained speed. With its wheels and flaps up, the cripple soared down and touched the runway. A flurry of dust burst upward as the airplane skidded wildly. In a moment, it smashed two fighters into wreckage, then lurched to a halt and broke in two. We landed immediately afterward, taxiing up to the wreckage, which miraculously failed to burn. The pilot who had forced himself to his feet only a minute before was unconscious. The co-pilot was dead. The engineer who had flown the cripple home was so badly wounded in the legs that he had to be carried from the airplane. Both bombardiers were badly shot up. The bone of one man's arm jutted through broken skin, and both were caked with their own blood. The two gunners were semi-conscious, also blood-soaked and seriously wounded, but were clinging to their guns with iron grips. It was the first time we had ever seen with such intimacy the terrible power of fighters' weapons. Death in the air had never been close. Even those men who died in burning planes were remote and distant. A man either came home or he didn't. But now we saw it for what it really was. The fighter sweeps continued, and during the next two days we shot down three more fighters. But no one at Ley realized that our steady victories paled by contrast with the catastrophic defeat of a major Japanese task force at Midway on June 5th. We knew of the battle since Tokyo had announced a major victory for our fleet forces. Imperial headquarters minimized our losses as insignificant. For the first time, however, we had doubts as to the accuracy of the reports. Our reasoning was simple enough. We knew Midway was to be invaded and occupied. If our fleet had withdrawn without carrying out that occupation, then something unforeseen had happened. 
We did not learn for a long time to come that four of our largest and most powerful aircraft carriers, along with 280 planes and most of their pilots, as well as thousands of men who formed the warship's complements, were lost. From June 5th through 15, a strange lull settled over the New Guinea front, broken only by a single raid against Ley on the 9th. I added two B-26 bombers to my score. On the 16th, the air war exploded with renewed fury. It was a field day for our fighters, when 21 Zeros caught three enemy fighter formations napping. We hit the first group of 12 fighters in a massed formation dive, which shattered the enemy ranks. I shot down one plane, and five other pilots each scored a victory. The remaining six enemy fighters escaped by diving. Back at high altitude, we dove from out of the sun at a second enemy formation of 12 planes. Again we struck without warning, and our plunging pass knocked three fighters out of the air. I scored my second victory in this firing run. A third wave of enemy planes approached even as we pulled out from the second diving attack. Some two dozen fighters came at us as we split up into two groups. Eleven zeros dove to hit a climbing formation, and the others met us at the same height. The formations disintegrated into a tremendous free-for-all directly above the Morrisby Air Base. The enemy planes were new P-39s, faster and more manoeuvrable than the older models. I jumped one fighter, which amazed me by flicking out of the way every time I fired a burst. We went around in the sky in a wild dogfight, the Aracobra pilot running through spins, loops, immelmans, dives, snap rolls, spirals, and other maneuvers. The pilot was superb, and with a better airplane, he might well have emerged the victor. But I kept narrowing the distance between our two planes with snap rolls to the left and clung grimly to his tail at less than 20 yards. Two short cannon bursts, and the fighter exploded in flames. That was my third victory of the day. The fourth, which followed almost immediately after, was ridiculously simple. A P-39 flashed by in front of me, paying attention only to the pursuing Zero, which zoomed upward in a desperate climb, firing as he went. The Aero Cobra ran directly into my fire, and I poured 200 rounds of machine gun bullets into the nose. The fighter snapped into an evading roll. I was out of cannon shells and fired a second burst into the belly. Still, it would not fall until a third burst caught the still rolling plane in the cockpit. The glass erupted and I saw the pilot slam forward. The P-39 fell off into a spin, then dove at great speed to explode in the jungle below. Four enemy fighters in one day. That was my record to date, and it contributed to the greatest defeat ever inflicted on the enemy in a single day's action by the lay wing. Our pilots claimed a total of 19 enemy fighters definitely destroyed in the air. On our way back to the field, Yonakawa kept breaking formation. He went into wild rolls, climbed, dove, dropped in falling leaves. He cavorted all over the sky, flying circles around my fighter. I understood why when he pulled alongside my own plane and held up two fingers, grinning broadly. Yonakawa was no longer the untried fledgling. Now he had three planes to his credit. He bubbled with exuberance. He flew upside down, waving both hands around in the cockpit. Then he flew directly over me, under me, and went through a wide hesitation roll around my fighter. He was like a kid, showing off. He finally flew on my wing and held the stick between his knees. Still grinning, he waved his lunchbox at me and started to eat. His exuberance was infectious. I waved four fingers at him and then opened a soda bottle. He pulled his out from his lunchbox and we drank a happy toast to one another. The day of victory was not over yet. Hardly had our planes been refueled and our ammunition belts replaced than a spotter report came in. Ten B-26s were on their way to the base. They could not have chosen a worse time, for nineteen fighters were off the ground before the marauders reached Ley. We failed to shoot any down, but damaged most of the planes and caused them to scatter their bombs wildly. During the pursuit away from Ley, ten P-39s came after us over Cape Ward Hunt, apparently in reply to the bombers' distress calls. One Aracobra went down in flames. Ley went wild with the victory that night. All the pilots were given extra rations of cigarettes, and the mechanics swarmed over us to share our jubilation.
Even better news was the word that we were to receive five days' leave at Rabaul. The cheers of the pilots shook the surrounding jungle. I was particularly relieved at the news of the five days' rest. Not only was I tired from the almost daily fights, but my mechanics wanted several days in which to work on my fighter. They called me over to show me the bullet holes in the wings and fuselage, and my stomach dropped when I saw a row of holes running directly behind the cockpit. They had missed me by no more than six inches. In 1942, none of our fighter planes carried pilot armor, nor did the Zeros have self-sealing tanks, as did the American planes. As the enemy pilots soon discovered, a burst of their 50 caliber bullets into the fuel tanks of a Zero caused it to explode violently in flames. Despite this, in those days, not one of our pilots flew with parachutes. This has been misinterpreted in the West as proof that our leaders were disdainful of our lives, that all Japanese pilots were expendable and regarded as pawns instead of human beings. This was far from the truth. Every man was assigned a parachute. The decision to fly without them was our own, and not the result of orders from any higher headquarters. Actually, we were urged, although not ordered, to wear the parachutes in combat. At some fields, the base commander insisted that chutes be worn, and those men had no choice but to place the bulky seat packs in their planes. Often, however, they never fastened the straps and used the chutes only as seat cushions. We had little use for these parachutes, for the only purpose they served for us was to hamstring our cockpit movements in a battle. It was difficult to move our arms and legs quickly when encumbered by chute straps. There was another and equally compelling reason for not carrying the chutes into combat. The majority of our battles were fought with enemy fighters over their own fields. It was out of the question to bail out over enemy-held territory, for such a move meant a willingness to be captured, and nowhere in the Japanese military code, or in the traditional Bushido, samurai code, could one find the distasteful words, prisoner of war. There were no prisoners. A man who did not return from a flight was dead. No fighter pilot of any courage would ever permit himself to be captured by the enemy. It was completely unthinkable. Nevertheless, it was acutely discomforting to discover a row of bullet holes only inches from where I sat. That night, I received confirmation of my four kills for the day's fighting. This was by no means unique in the Imperial Navy and I know of a score of other naval flyers who matched or exceeded this number of planes shot down in a single day. This gave me a total of 43 victories. Nishizawa, who went on to become Japan's greatest ace with a final toll of just over 100 enemy planes shot down in combat, hit his record on August 7 over Guadalcanal, when he gunned six American Navy fighters out of the air. A year later, naval air pilot 1C Kenji Okabe, shot down a total of seven F-4F Wildcats, TBF Avengers, and SBD Dauntlesses in a single day in a series of actions over Rabaul. Okabe landed his plane three times to refuel and rearm during the day's fighting, to set an all-time record for the Navy. Almost every pilot who accomplished this feat was, however, killed shortly afterward in combat. The two exceptions of whom I personally know are myself and Nishizawa, and the devil, never lived out the war. Ironically, Nishizawa was killed in October of 1944 over Cebu in the Philippines, unable to fire a single shot in defense of his life. Several Hellcat fighters caught him in an unarmed, unescorted DC-3 transport and shot down the plane in flames, an ignominious end for Japan's greatest pilot. That night, I received orders to report to the base commander, an event of rare occurrence. At Captain Saito's billet, I found that Lieutenant Sasai also had been summoned and that Deputy Commander Nakajima was with Saito. Both officers appeared glum. Captain Saito spoke. I have been questioning the wisdom of telling you this news and am doing so at the direct recommendation of Commander Nakajima. It is an unpleasant task for me. Earlier this month, I requested Tokyo headquarters to reward Lieutenant Sasai for his extraordinarily fine leadership of his squadron in combat. At the same time, I also asked for recognition of Sakai's outstanding accomplishments in battle, which make him, so far as we know, the leading ace of the entire Imperial Navy. However, 
These requests were not granted. Tokyo did not see fit to break with established precedent. There has never in all our history been a living hero, Saito emphasized, and apparently Tokyo is adamant about making any changes at this time. They have refused, he added with regret, even to award a medal or to promote you in rank. I was undecided about revealing these details to you, he concluded, lest it lead you falsely to criticize the actions of our high command. But it is equally important to me that you both be aware that I, as your commanding officer, am fully cognizant of your devotion and your unflagging effort. Commander Nakajima spoke up. It has always been the Navy's tradition, right or wrong, to award decorations and grant special promotions only on a posthumous basis. This tradition, of course, is of little comfort to you at the moment. I feel you should know that Captain Saito requested for Lieutenant Sasai the rank of commander, for Sakai his ensign's bar. Sasai answered at once. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your consideration and your efforts on my behalf. I must add, however, that neither Sakai nor I are dissatisfied with Tokyo's decision. I do not see any reason for us to hold any malice. It is my opinion, and I am sure that I speak for Sakai as well, that our accomplishments and air victories are not ours alone. Without our wingmen flying cover for us, without the devotion of our ground crews, we would be able to do nothing. I am satisfied that our team functions so well, and I do not feel that individual recognition is necessary as a reward, although I am most honoured that you should have acted for us the way you did. Sasai expressed perfectly everything I could have hoped to say, and I nodded my agreement. The naval policy of abstaining from recognition of individual exploits was carried out steadfastly to the end of the war. There was but one exception to this rule, and it was made as late as March of 1945, when Admiral Somu Toyoda, commander of the Combined Fleet, commended NAP 1C Shoichi Sugita and me, then an ensign, for our outstanding number of victories in the air. By then the commendation was meaningless. The great pilots of our navy, Nishizawa, Ota, Sasai, and others, were dead. Chapter 20 During the month of June, we encountered an ever-increasing number of enemy fighters and bombers. We were told that the enemy was staging a major build-up of air power in the area, and that from now on, we would carry out stronger fighter sweeps. It was clear to all that we would need every zero we could lay our hands on. The enemy was hacking more airstrips out of the jungle growth in the general area of Moresby. Our bomber attacks also increased in weight and frequency, and enemy fighters met every raid with determined aggressiveness. On June 17th, 12 Zeros escorted 18 bombers against Port Moresby, and held seven intercepting fighters away from the bombers, which hit the pier area and sank an 8,000-ton freighter docked in the harbour. The seven American fighters harried our force of 30 planes all the way from Moresby to Cape Ward Hunt, but without success. The following day, nine bombers and an equal number of fighters raided Kido in Rescar Bay, a new enemy base north of Moresby, which was rapidly being stocked with fighters. Ten enemy fighters hit the 18 Japanese planes, again without causing any losses, and lost two of their own number. On June 24th, I returned to Leh from my leave at Rabaul and took off the next morning as part of a sweep of 21 fighters against Moresby. Action was brisk, and I shot down one of the 11 enemy planes claimed for the day's action. The next morning Rabaul sent 19 bombers back to Moresby, with 11 fighters escorting. 12 enemy planes intercepted them, and the Zeros shot down three. That was the last raid during June. The next day, a torrential downpour engulfed the New Guinea area. The rain continued to beat down, not only against our fields, but against those of the Allies as well. Our successes in April, May and June had been due in part to the excellent flying weather we enjoyed during the day. Clouds gathered almost every afternoon, but not until 3 or 4 p.m., by which time we were back on the ground. Violent squalls swept over the area in the evening and continued intermittently during the night. These were more of a blessing than an inconvenience, because they prevented the enemy from conducting his nocturnal assaults with any regularity, and we were able to sleep through most of the nights. July brought an abrupt change in the weather. 
No longer did the evening squalls permit uninterrupted slumber, and for days on end, the night skies were clear and starlit. The bombers came. Almost every night, their thunder shattered the darkness, and then the bombs rained down ceaselessly. The Mitchells and marauders swept up and down the field, bombing and strafing at will. We were helpless against the attacks. Even had the runway been large enough to accommodate night operations, it is doubtful that we could have done much damage with the Zero. So we remained on the ground, cowering in shelters and cursing the Americans. Those who suffered the most were the maintenance crews. They were denied even the satisfaction of going out on missions and seeing the enemy planes falling in flames. Instead, their lot was almost round-the-clock labor to keep our relatively low number of fighters in operational condition. In addition, they were now deprived of even their snatches of sleep as the nightly bombing attacks increased in fury. We were hit with a particularly heavy raid on the early morning of July 2nd. The clamor of the air raid alarms roused us out of our sleep before daybreak. We threw on our flying suits and ran to the field. Hardly had we reached the runway when the thunder of motors, accompanied by the shattering roar of the first bombs, burst out of the night. Every pilot ran frantically for the nearest shelter. There was no time to reach the dugouts. Instead, we hurled ourselves into the nearest craters. We could see the bombers against the stars. They were Mitchells and Marauders, no higher than 600 feet, the bluish flames from their exhaust pipes flickering in the night sky with an eerie radiance. But they seemed anything but beautiful to us as we cowered at the bottom of our craters. With their bombs expended, the planes came back at treetop level, strafing across the runway and pouring their slugs into every building within sight. We dashed back for the craters and huddled miserably. The enemy bullets sprayed the field like bursts of hail. Somehow, none of the pilots was hit. Then, the planes were gone, working over the other end of the field. I crawled from the crater and dashed for the command post. There was little time to lose in crossing the field. With all our planes held down, it seemed only a matter of seconds or minutes before another wave would hit us. The open crater was no place to linger during a strafing attack. The command post was still intact, but now, the bombers had swung around and were spraying the tower and the shack with machine gun bullets. Sailors entrenched in the barricades around the CP threw a storm of bullets into the air from their guns, but succeeded only in wasting ammunition. The men knew nothing about leading a plane, and the tracers asked away in the night behind the speeding bombers. Their lack of accuracy astounded me. I forgot about the shelters and ran for the gun positions. I shoved one man away from his gun, telling him that I would take over. The man clung grimly to his weapon, refusing to abandon his post, shouting he had no authority to leave. I wasted no time arguing with him, but knocked him out of his seat. He rose to his feet, muttering curses, but another pilot who had come up behind me shoved him out of the way and picked up the ammunition belts. The sailor departed in a hurry. The second wave of six B-26s hit the field at that moment. I jerked back on the trigger and held it down, watching the tracers flaring into the air. A marauder passed almost overhead, and I walked the flaming shells from the nose back to the tail. But the bomber never wavered and came roaring down at the gun position in a shallow dive, the nose gunner answering my fire. This was my first experience on the ground with a plane coming straight at me, and fear of the ripping shells engulfed me. The vision of the bombs hurtling down and exploding directly on the gun position was both startling and fearsome. Fright overcame every other emotion, and I abandoned the gun, running as quickly as I could for the sandbag shelter behind me. I didn't even run all the way, but I leaped in a flying tackle for the shelter. For a few seconds I sat there, feeling like an idiot and an unreasonable coward. The B-26 roared overhead, passing by without bombing. I cursed my own quaking body and returned to the gun I had deserted. Slowly I stopped shaking and regained my presence of mind. This time, as I squatted behind the gun, I swore I would not run like a rabbit. The bombers were back, the sound of their motors from only 150 feet overhead, a thundering, pounding crescendo which smashed against my eardrums. They were great black shapes darting out of the darkness, spitting flame from their turrets, their exhausts piercing the gloom in flickering blue fire. 
I caught the trailing bomber with a burst, holding the gun steady as the plane flew into my line of fire. A thin streamer of smoker appeared, but the plane flew on steadily and then disappeared in the distance, still in formation. Dawn broke after more than one full hour of continuous bombing and strafing attack by the enemy planes, which had swept over Ley with impunity. Not a single plane was shot down, although many thousands of rounds of ammunition were fired by the anti-aircraft weapons. The pilots were so demoralized by the attack that even after the last bombs had fallen, no one ran out to the fighters to take off in pursuit, as we had always done before. Most of the installations on the field were burning. Deep craters had turned the runway into a shambles, which would have prevented any flying, even had we attempted it. It seemed impossible, but the twenty fighter planes parked on both sides of the runway were safe, holed only with stray bullets and bomb fragments. We assembled at the command post for further orders. The pilots were bewildered and enraged by the pounding we had suffered. One flyer in particular, NRP-2C Mitsuo Suitsu, recently assigned to Lei, fairly choked with anger. He swore he would get a bomber on the next raid, even if he had to ram the plane. However, few paid much attention to him. Before the enemy planes were out of sight, nearly 200 men were on the field, working furiously with shovels and wheelbarrows to fill in the many craters, and to clear the stones and pieces of steel from the runway. And then suddenly several orderlies came running from the command post, shouting hysterically, Another attack is on the way. More than 100 enemy planes are approaching the field. 100 planes. That was an incredible number. We had never heard of an attack of such magnitude. There was a flurry among the staff officers, and then shouted orders for every plane to get into the air at once. We ran to our fighters, and as soon as the engines were warmed up, started to taxi to the runway, which had now been prepared sufficiently for safe takeoff. The Zeros were moving into takeoff position when the staff officers dashed out of the command post, waving their arms wildly in the air, shouting and running down to the strip. They crossed their arms in the air, the signal to cut our engines. When they came up to the fighters, they explained, The alert is called off. Our spotters made a mistake. One officer even laughed. The 100 enemy planes turned out to be a formation of migrating birds. Everyone burst into laughter. The entire episode seemed ludicrous after the tension under which we had labored. We ate lunch as we sat around the command post, ready to take off in event of any further attacks. The enemy was busy today. We were still eating when the orderlies ran to us with news that Salamawa had reported six B-17s on their way to our base. No one wasted a moment. Our mess kits went flying in all directions as we raced for the fighters. Salamawa was only several minutes by air from Ley, and the bombers would soon be upon us. I never got off the ground. The other fighters were racing down the runway while I cursed an engine which refused to turn over. I tried again and again, kicking the starter. The engine was dead, and by the time I climbed in disgust from the airplane, all the other fighters were in the air. I ran across the strip for the shelters. Commander Nakajima was waving his arms furiously, shouting for me to hurry. He kept pointing to the sky. I was twenty yards from the shelter when the shriek of a falling bomb split the air like a great knife. I flung myself the last few feet through the air and crashed onto the back of men, already huddled on the ground in the dugout. In that same second, the world seemed to blow up. There was a deafening roar and the earth heaved wildly below me. I felt something heavy pressing on my body from all directions, a terrible pressure, and then absolute blackness. I saw nothing and heard nothing. It was as though I had been cut off from the world around me. I tried to move my arms and legs, but without success. I was gripped solidly. It may have been seconds or minutes, it was impossible to tell, when I heard a voice calling from far off. It was Commander Nakajima. Sakai! Sakai! Where are you? Silence for a while. Then the shouting again. Where is he? Did Sakai make it? Look for him, damn it. I tried to shout back in reply. I thought I had shouted, but, strangely, I could not hear my own voice. My mouth, my lips, had not even moved. Something heavy was pressing against my chin. Again Nakajima's voice came, dimly, far away. He must be buried. Start looking for him.
Don't waste a second. Dig. Buried. Of course. I was beneath rocks and sand. I opened my eyes slightly. Blackness. Then fear swept over me. I felt I was choking, that the sand was suffocating me. I tried to writhe, but I could not move an inch. The terror was choking. Nakajima's voice came again, a little louder this time. Dig with anything you can get your hands on. Come on, you sticks. Use your hands and your fingernails if you have nothing else. Hurry. Then the sounds of scratching, of shovels digging in the sand. I waited, trying to keep from squirming. Then they were through. A hand brushed my face, felt for my skin, then brushed the sand away from my mouth and nose. Sunlight burst about me suddenly as my rescuers broke through and pulled me out. I was not the only one buried. At least a dozen men were caught in the sudden collapse of the dugout when a bomb exploded nearby. But not a single man was injured. We were covered from head to foot with sand and mud, which had, fortunately for us, cushioned the shock of the shelter's collapse. The command post was scattered wreckage, and a gaping crater nearby attested to our good fortune in escaping a direct hit. Most of the planes still on the runway had been smashed into small pieces, and the fuel tanks of several were flaming. Nearly an hour later, the fighters which had taken off returned to the base. The men were glum. The six fortresses had fought off their attacks with apparent ease. It took us two days to restore the airbase after the July 2nd attacks. By the 4th, we were ready for a retaliation raid against Moresby. It was still July 3rd by the Americans' calendar, but we felt we could add to their celebration of their Independence Day with a few fireworks of our own. 21-0 fighters hit Moresby to find a welcome committee of 20 enemy fighters waiting for us. We attacked while the Allied planes were still diving. Our pilots claimed nine fighters definitely destroyed and three others as probables. We were still many miles from Ley on our return flight when I noticed a haze of black smoke drifting before the wind. As the airbase came into sight, we saw that the smoke came from flaming installations directly on the field. Sheets of fire soared into the air, spilling boiling clouds of black smoke over the jungle and the beach. What had happened was obvious. In our absence, enemy bombers had struck our fuel dumps. We were still gliding in on our landing approach when seven marauders roared in low over the jungle. We failed to see the bombers before they were over the field, their black bombs tumbling through the air to send geysers of flame and dirt high above the runway. Even as we wheeled in pursuit, several fighters shot into the air from the field and more than 26 zeros in all went racing madly after the seven fleeing B-26. For several moments there was near chaos in the sky as everyone rolled madly to get away from the other pursuing planes. Collisions were averted by only a few feet. One fighter, which had taken off from Ley, pulled away from the main group. The Zero passed the bombers and then swung up and around in a sharp 180 degree turn and plunged with terrifying speed toward the lead bomber. What appeared to be a fearless head-on attack exploded into a terrifying moment of carnage. The Japanese pilot was not firing his guns. He was going to ram. In a blur of movement, with a closing speed of nearly 600 miles an hour between the two planes, the Zero barely missed the marauder's right propeller, slipped along the fuselage, and with its wing, razored off the bomber's vertical fin and rudder. The Zero continued flying straight and level, apparently unharmed. Then it began a series of slow rolls, gradually losing altitude. It plunged into the sea at full speed. Seconds afterward, the B-26, without its vertical fin, yawed and rolled crazily, flipped over on its back and plunged into the water with a blinding explosion. Less than five minutes later, with at least six fighters pouring a torrent of cannon shells and bullets into its fuselage and wings, another B-26 plummeted into the waves. The five other bombers escaped. Back at Ley, I found that the pilot who had rammed the marauder was the same man who, on July 2nd, had sworn he would take an enemy bomber down with him. Suitsu had made good his threat. We hit Moresby again on the 6th. Fifteen fighters escorted 21 bombers, and our planes claimed three fighters destroyed. From July 7th through the 10th, it was the enemy's turn. 
For three successive nights, we cowered like rats in our shelters. Lay became a nightmare of exploding bombs, of tracers raking the airbase from one end to the other, of geysers of flame and smoke, burning planes, wrecked buildings, and hundreds of bomb craters. There was no doubt that the enemy intended to try to blast the Lai installation into a smoking ruin. But despite his attacks, he never achieved his main purpose. We always had fighters available to fly. On the 11th, we made another maximum bomber effort against Moresby, with 12 fighters escorting 21 bombers from Rabaul. We were en route to the enemy base when Lieutenant Sasai discovered six B-17s on their way to hit our field. He broke off from the escort formation, taking five other fighters with him. It was poor judgment on Sasai's part. He signaled Nishizawa, Ota and me to join his flight, and the six of us attacked the big bombers in a long series of firing passes. But the flying fortresses proved as formidable as their name implied. We damaged three bombers, but failed to down any of the enemy planes. Their gunners were improving, one zero went down in flames, and the other fighters, including my own, were holed with enemy bullets. With only six zeros flying escort, the formation which hit Moresby was scattered by enemy fighters. Consequently, their bombs fell over a wide area and caused little damage to the enemy installations. Sasai received a severe reprimand for leaving the bombers with such slight protection. He made no attempt to vindicate his action and accepted his rebuke silently. There was no doubt that he had violated the cardinal rule of escort fighters, never leave the bombers unprotected. His pilots, however, sympathised with Sasai. The B-17s were a painful thorn in our side. Their ability to ward off our attacks with such success both baffled and enraged us. We entered a new phase of fighter operations on July 21st when a Japanese army division landed at Buna, 110 miles south of Leh. The troops at once worked their way inland on a frantic march through wild jungle toward Port Moresby. On a map, the proposed manoeuvre appeared simple to execute. Buna seemed but a stone's throw away from Moresby, across the neck of the Papuan Peninsula, but the maps of the jungle islands are altogether different from the fierce conditions below in the dense foliage. The Japanese high command made a terrible and fatal error in committing our troops to the Moresby attack. Before the battle was ended, Japan had suffered one of her most tragic and humiliating disasters. The Owen Stanley Mountains are nearly as high as the fearsome Alps. To describe the wild jungle on the mountain slope merely as dense growth is to indulge in understatement. The profusion of plant life is unbelievable. If there were no swamps underfoot, nor bogs, nor mud, nor soft yielding dead plant growth, then there were razor-sharp rocks, precipitous slopes, all manner of vines and insects, oppressive heat and diseases which struck men down mysteriously. Crossing the alpine glaciers is a simple task in comparison to the heartbreaking and brutal struggle of breaking through the Owen Stanley mountain jungles. It was virtually impossible to supply the troops once they were swallowed up by the jungle morass. The injured and wounded found their wounds festering in the sweltering heat and sodden humidity. Water drained from men's bodies from every pore. Equipment rotted away. Clothes fell off in tatters. Feet were cut to pulp by rocks and razor-sharp jungle grass and leaves. For several months, our troops struggled doggedly through the worst enemy they had ever faced, an enemy which did not fire guns or sow landmines or strafe, but which swallowed up hundreds of men with a single gulp and never again released their captives. Through superhuman feats, several elements actually managed to close within a few miles of their coveted goal, the Moresby Bastion. But even these successful troops met only heartbreaking failure. Almost is not enough, and before the operation was over, or more properly, before it simply dissolved, every man perished, the majority from starvation deep within jungles from which they could find no escape. The overland attack was a move of desperation. Originally, our high command scheduled a massive amphibious assault against Moresby, but this move was eliminated on May 7th and 8th during the Coral Sea battle, when two Japanese carriers encountered two enemy. Carriers in the first sea duel, in which no surface ship fired at an opponent. 
Each force used its planes to pound, the other with constant aerial bombing. We won the battle, but the enemy achieved his objective. The amphibious assault was cancelled. With our troops ashore at Buna, Rabul headquarters ordered our attacks against Moresby discontinued and called for constant air support of the beachhead. The Buna landings were but a part of a larger operation, which was doomed to defeat even as it got underway. Not only did the jungle pose a threat of enormous magnitude, but our men were hobbled by a thorough lack of understanding of the problems of logistics on the part of their leaders. These weaknesses, combined with brilliant moves on the part of the enemy, assured a disaster from the very first. Simultaneously with the Buna landings, a commando unit raced ashore at the easternmost tip of New Guinea. Working day and night, the men hacked a new airstrip out of the jungle at Rabi, which was intended to safeguard the flow of overland supplies to the men moving across New Guinea from the Buna beachhead. Strangely, the enemy failed to bomb the construction work at Rabi, but remained satisfied with photographs taken from reconnaissance planes. However, almost as soon as the men completed the new Rabi field, enemy troops burst onto their unsuspecting ranks in a surprise attack and overwhelmed the Japanese garrison. It was a brilliant stroke. We built the field. The Americans and Australians used it for their own planes. They were not content with merely this one new field. It was evident to all of us that the Allies were building up their air strength for an all-out interdiction of Ley and Rabaul. Their engineers hacked out new airstrips from the jungle with amazing speed. Medium bombers and fighters moved onto the new runways even as their construction equipment kept working. And the attacks against Ley continued to increase in weight of aircraft and bombs. Rarely did a night pass when their Mitchells and Marauders failed to appear, bombing and strafing at will. During the day, Lay juggled its 20 to 30 operational fighters to keep six to nine zeros always in the air over Buna, as well as a standby force to protect the field. The air cover at Buna was far below our needs, but the fighters managed to prevent any large-scale attacks from destroying the beachhead facilities. Buna was a shock to me on my first patrol. I had seen many landing operations before from the air, but never had I witnessed such a pathetic attempt to supply a full infantry division. Soldiers milled around on the beach, carrying cases of supplies into the jungle by hand. Only two small transports with a single small sub-chaser as their escorts stood off, the beach unloading new supplies. Flying cover for the beachhead proved eventually more difficult than anticipated. No longer did heavy cloud layers mean a day of comparative rest. On July 22nd, in a group of six zeros, we flew wide circles in what appeared to be an otherwise empty sky. A thick overcast hung at 7,000 feet above the ground. Without warning, a series of tremendous explosions rocked the beach area, and columns of flame and smoke erupted into the sky. Seconds later, thick, greasy smoke boiled out of the critical supply dump several hundred yards off the shore. No other planes could be seen. Either they had dropped their bombs through the overcast with spectacular accuracy, which seemed highly unreasonable, or one or more planes had dropped below the clouds, released their bombs, and slipped back into the protection of the grey mass without being seen. The latter proved to be the case, for several minutes later I caught sight of a tiny speck moving out of the edge of the overcast, far to the southeast. We turned and pursued the fleeing plane, which, as we drew closer, was identifiable as our old friend, the twin-engined Lockheed Hudson. We were about a mile away when we were sighted. The bomber nosed down and fled along the coast, trying to make Rabi. Its speed was high, almost as great as that of our own fighters. I jettisoned the fuel tank and pushed the throttle to maximum overboost. From a distance of 600 yards and to the rear left, I fired a burst from all four guns at the plane, hoping the Hudson would turn and allow me to lessen the distance between our two planes. What happened next was startling. No sooner had I fired than the Hudson went up in a steep climbing turn to the right, rolled quickly, and roared back with full speed directly at me. I was so surprised that for several moments I sat motionless in the cockpit. The next second every forward-firing gun in the Hudson opened up in a withering barrage. Our Zeros scattered wildly, rolling or diving in different directions. 
Nothing like this had ever happened before. I caught a glimpse of Lieutenant Sasai. His jaw hung open in astonishment at the audacity of the enemy pilot. One zero, piloted by Nishizawa, who refused to be impressed by anything, rolled out of his sudden breakaway and came down behind the bomber, his guns spitting flame. Again we were astounded. The Hudson heeled over in a snap roll, the fastest I had ever seen for a twin-engined plane. Nishizawa's guns sprayed only empty air. The remaining pilots, myself included, hurled our planes at the Hudson. All of us failed to score a single hit. The bomber rolled and soared up and down in violent maneuvers, with the top gunner firing steadily at our planes. The Zero pilots went wild with fury. Our formation disintegrated, and every man went at the Hudson with everything he had. I made at least four firing passes, and was forced to break off my attack by other pilots who screamed in without regard for their wingmates. For nearly ten minutes we pursued the Hudson, pouring a hail of lead and explosive shells at the amazing plane. Finally, a heavy burst caught the rear turret. I saw the gunner throw his hands up and collapse. Without the interfering stream of bullets from the turret, I closed into twenty yards and held the gun trigger down, aiming for the right wing. Seconds later flame streamed out, then spread to the left wing. The pilot stayed with the ship. It was too low for him or the crew to bail out. The Hudson lost speed rapidly and glided in toward the jungle. Trees sheared off the two flaming wings and the fuselage, also trailing great sheets of flame, burst into the dense growth like a giant sliver of burning steel. There was a sudden explosion and smoke boiled upward. The day was full of surprises. We were on our way back to Ley to resume the beachhead patrol when five Aero Cobras attempted a surprise attack against our formation. The enemy planes flew in a long column low over the water, attempting to climb rapidly and catch us unawares. I was the first to sight the enemy group. I went into a steep turn and dove for the Aero Cobras, heading directly at the lead plane. Abruptly, the five P-39s scattered in all directions, turned, and raced away. With their advantage of surprise gone, and five other Zeros directly behind me, they wanted no part of a battle in which they were at a height disadvantage. With the speed from my dive, I was soon among the enemy group. Two fighters zoomed wildly and disappeared into low-hanging clouds. Another disappeared within a shower of rain, and yet another seemed to have vanished into thin air. One Aracobra was still in the clear, and I went after the fighter at maximum speed. He was heading for clouds, but a burst across his nose changed his mind. The P-39 flicked over in a left roll and dove for the sea with me 200 yards behind. It was the new model Aerocobra, which, at sea level, was equal in speed to my own fighter. But the pilot had made a fatal error. He was flying in the wrong direction. Instead of fleeing to Moresby, he was headed in exactly the opposite direction. I still had plenty of fuel and was content to maintain the distance between our planes, all the way to Rabal if necessary. Several minutes later, the American pilot came to his senses and realized his error. He had no choice but to reverse his course, and the fighter winged over in a sharp left bank and turn. This had happened many times before. I cut inside his turn, moving in slightly below and to the left of the fighter. A short burst sent the Aracobra rolling violently to escape my fire. I clung to his tail as he whipsawed back and forth, heading for the coastline. For precious seconds, I lost the fighter when he went through some unusually wild maneuvers, and the P-39 raced away for his home base, with several hundred yards distance between our two planes. Even with the engine on overboost, I could not close the distance between us. I was almost ready to turn away. So long as the P-39 kept a straight and true course, it was impossible for me to reach firing position. The enemy pilot chose otherwise. Instead of staying over the sea, he headed directly for the Owen Stanley Mountains, which forced him into a climb, and no P-39 could outclimb a zero. Slowly but steadily, I closed the distance between us. I held my fire for a burst at the closest possible range. With my ammunition low after the battle with the Hudson, I would have enough for only one or two quick bursts, fifty yards, then it shrunk to forty, then thirty. I gripped the gun trigger, aiming carefully. 
I had not fired a single shot when the pilot bailed out of the fighter. The Aero Cobra was less than 150 feet above the ground when his form tumbled into the air, in a drop, which seemed to be certain death. I knew of no instance where a pilot had survived a bailout from less than 300 feet. Miraculously, the chute snapped open a split second before the pilot struck the ground. He dropped into a small clearing while his fighter exploded a scant few yards in front of him. I still could not believe that the enemy pilot had lived through his incredible descent. I turned steeply and flew back over the jungle clearing. Only the parachute was visible. The pilot had lived and was in good enough condition to flee from sight. It was my second victory, without firing a shot, and raised my total to 49 planes. The next few weeks were spent in maintaining cover over the Buna Beach area, but the latter half of July meant a new and strange phase of the war for us. No longer did we fly without parachutes. Orders had come down from higher headquarters, and Captain Saito directed every pilot to wear his chute into combat. It was a strange sensation to feel the chute packed on my seat below me, and the straps around my body. I had never flown with one before. Equally disturbing to us were further orders which carried unspoken but ominous implications. We were taken off the offensive. Captain Saito issued orders that from now on, no fighters would cross the Owen Stanley range, no matter how compelling the reason. Only on one occasion, July 26th, did I see Port Moresby again. We had intercepted five marauders over Buna, and during the running fight as the bombers fled for home, I shot two B-26 out of the air, kills confirmed by the other pilots. With Sasai and Endo behind me, I pursued the remaining bombers, crossing the mountain range against orders. I shot up one bomber, but failed to see it crash, and received only a probable. That was the last time I ever flew over the enemy base. Our situation was changing rapidly. By the end of the first week in August, we began to fight under conditions we had never before known. The Americans had launched a tremendous invasion of Guadalcanal Island, 